1 Peter chapter 2 and verse 9, a very familiar text this morning, it says, but you are a chosen generation. Isn't that right? Yeah. A royal priesthood and a holy nation, a peculiar people, that you should show forth the praises of him who called you out of darkness into his marvelous light, which in times past were not a people, but are now the people of God, which have not obtained mercy, but now have obtained mercy. I want to speak to you just for a few moments this morning about your call, make it personal, my call to the priesthood. My call to the priesthood. The word of the Lord says again that you are a chosen generation. You're a royal priesthood, a holy nation. One of the things that we desire to stress here in the house of Judah time and time again is that we are careful not to take the priesthood away from the body of Christ. You know, it's a wonderful thing that you're in the midst of a, of a people that are worshipers and they love to worship and they love to be in the presence of the Lord. But that does not negate our individual responsibility to offer appropriate sacrifices. Matter of fact, in that same text, uh, it's Peter declares that we are lively stones and we build up this spiritual house. Okay, and we bring spiritual sacrifices. That's not just the duty of myself and the worship team and, and, uh, and those that are leading in dance. That is the responsibility of every believer in the room. Because we were, we were, we were created for worship. Tell yourself, I'm an instrument of worship. I'm at his best when I worship. Matter of fact, I love to worship. Can you declare that? I just love to worship. Worship looks good on me. Amen. Worship makes my father happy when he sees me worshiping. Amen. But I want you to consider for a few moments, and there are some specific things as we tried to start uh, last Sunday on Easter Sunday. For those of you that, not, that were not with this happy past resurrection day, for those of us that know the truth about it, every day is resurrection day. Amen. Exodus 25, and God is charging the children of Israel to gather or bring back to him all the spoils that they collected from Egypt. And, you know, that was probably a very emotional time for the, for the children of Israel to have to go back and for one last time look into the face of those people that they had served for 400 years and ask them for, for things that they needed for their journey. Right? So I, I just want you to get some things in your mind that maybe the, the enemy took from you while you were enslaved to that season of your life. You were struggling with that storm. Maybe he robbed you of some time. Rob you of some joy, rob you of some deliverance, rob you of some happiness, rob you of some, of, some, of some principles and promises that were for you. I want you to look back at the enemy and say, it's time for you to pay back now. I got a revelation. You have to pay me. As a matter of fact, said once I expose you, you the thief, you've got to give it back sevenfold. So I'm looking for a sevenfold return. Come on. You're still waiting on your income tax tech. Just say right now, I'm going to say to these principalities and powers, it's time for you to give up something. I need some change. I need some back pay. So, so they got all these things that were the spoils from their time in Egypt, and God asked them to bring those things to him willingly and if they brought them willingly he would of those things make a place for himself to dwell in tell your neighbor neighbor god wants to dwell in all that history god wants to dwell in all of your experience all of your pain all of your struggle all your storm all the things that hindered you from breakthrough god wants to dwell in the midst of that he wants to make a sanctuary out of those things he wants to show you how he is still the God that can redeem anything. God can redeem anything. Say with me. God can redeem, God can redeem anything. anything. He can recover anything. anything. All right. So here they are. They're they are in the process, listening to the command of Moses, desiring uh, to hear the word of the Lord. And God says of this thing that they're about to build. God is very clear to make sure Moses understands in 25 and 9, according to the all that I show thee after the pattern of the tabernacle. So God has a pattern for which he wants to make this thing. All right, you just can't throw anything in the pot and hope that it comes out good. Now, one of my favorite desserts is dumb cake. Right? Y'all know what a dumb cake is? Y'all don't. Y'all don't know what a dumb cake is. There you go. See, see, we got some, we got some babies in the room. Well, you take cake ingredients. And without necessarily mix them, you throw them into a baking dish, and it comes all together and cooks on its own. Now, the key is that you put cake ingredients in it. You just can't dump green beans and strained beans and potatoes in your cake recipe and hope that it comes out to be a cake. 
So even though God is asking them to bring stuff, he has some order to not only what he's asking for, but how they're supposed to, to build this tabernacle. David, you got to have a pattern. Now, I know a few seamstress, they don't need a pattern to make certain garments. They just bad like that. Right? You just give them a piece of fabric, give them an idea, and they just throw it together. There's some of us not only need a pattern, but we need a few more lessons. Right? It just don't come together like that. I remember back in the day, now, and I know y'all don't know nothing about this because I'm just, you know, 27 something. Anyway, but uh, we went to, uh, we had industrial arts and we had home ec. Yep. And it was more men in home ec class than the sisters. Y'all don't know nothing about that, right? Now, in home ec class, I remember making ice cream. Y'all don't know nothing about that. Right? And uh, we decided we was going to double and triple the recipe. Now, you know, in home ec, you know, you're only supposed to be making a little bit. We had a whole, we were sharing down the hallway with other classes. We had so much stuff. But it, you, you have to be careful when certain ingredients are, are added to it. Now, I, I know a little bit about the kitchen, but there's some stuff I don't know about it, even if you gave me the pattern. Right? But God is real specific to Moses about making sure that he constructs this thing in the earth ramp according to the pattern that he saw in heaven. Because what Moses is about to make is not just an instrument or a place of worship in the land. It is a shadow of something that's better to come. So in the best of his natural ability, he's trying to construct you and I mm -hmm. from the memories and histories of a people that have been in bondage. So everything that they put in this tabernacle, the furniture, the curtains, the pins, the knobs, the wall, all of it is speaking to you and I coming to our rightful place. Tell your neighbor, today, today I got the word of the Lord. The word. And the word of the Lord for your life is you about to step into your rightful place. Today, tell them like today, I mean today. You're going to step into your rightful place. Well, what did it look like? Well, God's intent, if you heard the man of God this morning, God is not moved by what we're doing right. He's not moved by what we're doing wrong. He's not moved by how many times you've been in it or how long you've been in it. God is still trying to get us back to the place that he saw us in before the foundation of the world. That's why he was adamant, even though mankind fell, he was adamant about calling them back to the place of worship because there is something that was already in your makeup called resilience. That when God formed you, knowing that we have the great propensity of going astray, propensity is that natural inclination. So if you haven't figured it out by yourself, without God on your side or people pressing you, there's something in you that's always going to go south toward the border. Right? right? You don't need any help. You don't need an excuse. There's just something in you that's always going to turn left, given an opportunity. But God knew that was in us. That's why the Lamb was slain from the foundation of the world. But God's aim is found in this same chapter, Exodus chapter 25 and verse 2. The word of the Lord says here, and let them... I'm sorry, verse 22. And 22. say it. Yes, Neil. And there I will meet with thee, and I will commune with thee from above the mercy seat, right. from between the two cherubims, which are upon the ark of the testimony. Read it again. And what? I will meet with thee, and I will commune with thee from above the mercy seat, from between the two cherubims, which are upon the ark of the testimony, of all things which I will give thee, and commandment of the children of Israel. All right, stop. Tell your neighbor, neighbor. God wants to meet you and me. God wants to meet you and me. There. there. I'm going to help us get there. Tell them again. I'm going to help us get there. God said, I want to meet us there. I want to meet you there and commune with you there. And then God gives a specific location. Where is it? Above the mercy seat. Between the what? Say it again, Annette. It's what? There. Tell you, David, you just got to get there. And it is above the Ark of the Covenant. It's between two cherubim angels, and it's called a seat called mercy. Now, I, I understand what God is really saying. He's not just asking you to come in, but there are other people in this place with you, in this place called there. And God said, in this place called there, I want you all to look at one another through this thing called mercy. It's the mercy seat. So the object of God's of God's tabernacle with us is that we are instruments to extend mercy to one another. 
right? There's a whole lot of people always criticizing you. Anybody remember that season? Everywhere you go, somebody, somebody had something bad to say about you or what you was doing. And it's good to know that God said, I put some people around you that can look beyond all that stuff and see you as the Father sees you. Thank God for mercy. So he wants to meet us above this place called the mercy seat. Right? He said, I want to commune with you. But there are some key things that are in this Ark of the Covenant that God wants to remind us of as we're looking at one another through mercy. They are the Ten Commandments, a dish of manna, and Aaron's rod that budded. Now, what do those things speak to? So here we are in this divine place that God has prepared for you and I. And God said, I want you to remember that you are here by divine providence. I gave you a law. The Ten Commandments represented God's vision, God's, God's instructions to a people. It just was not just laws about how to stay in relationship with God, but it also governed laws of how I stay in relationship with you. So in this thing that we are meeting around, or meeting on top of, God said, I never want you to get away from the fact that if you really say you love me, it's going to be manifested by what you do with the ones you see every day. That's just basic. So God said, do you love me? Well, how do you treat your neighbor? Right? Right. You had a dish of manna. The dish of manna was God's ability to say to us, and this is why all this is so powerful. We are a chosen generation, a nation that should be in the place to declare. When everything dries up, we already know the way. Huh? When things run out, we already know it's just an opportunity for God to work another miracle. Anybody? When, when, you know, move us around, change your job description, change our job, move us to another city. It does not change the fact that our God still provides. He can do supernatural stuff. He's the God of the supernatural, right? He can send us on an Elijah journey. We can end up in a brook. The brook dry up, he'll send a raven. Raven quit flying, he'll send us to a widow's house. Widow run out, he'll just say, what kind of pots and pans you got in the house? You cannot exhaust God from taking care of us. Any witness in the room. And then there was Aaron's rod. Now, Aaron's rod was a piece of a tree that was separated from the main trunk. And over time, this dead piece of wood started budding. God said, I want you to remember that when things look dead, I can bring life out of it. Why? Because I'm still in control. I am still supreme. The rod represented God's supremacy. So you've got, you've got God's law, you've got God's provision, and that fact that God is supreme. All gathering around this thing called mercy. Now, the Bible is very clear. There was only one individual that was allowed to go in and behold all this glory. Turn, if you would, from ex for, to Leviticus 16. And that was the high priest. Right. The high priest would have been Aaron and his sons. Y'all flowing with me a little bit? Yeah. Aaron and his sons, one day out of the year, that day was called the day of a... And on that particular day, the, this, this high priest was able to go back here and behold all this glory, all this presence, all this kind of... But he had to have some things with him. Two things that were critical. He had to have some blood, and he had to have some incense. He had to have blood, and he had to have worship. He had to have the blood of atonement, and he had to have some praise on this one day. And the Bible was very clear that said on this day, he wore certain garments because he was not only representing himself, he was representing the nation. Right. So on his breastplate, he had, he had an ephod, and it had stones in it. Right? And those stones represented all the tribes of Israel. On his shoulders were two onyx stones, and there were six, six tribes engraved on each one of those stones. So when he went into the presence of God, even though he was the only one that was able to enter, he, he remembered that he was carrying you and I into the presence of the Lord. Now, that has not changed. Our worship is not just for us. We carry people into the presence of the Lord. God said, I want you to carry them in your heart and I want you to carry them on your shoulders. Right? So when God meets you and I, he meets us. 
tell you, they, I'm not in this place by myself. Now, I know, let's make a, I know you carry your family members, you carry your prayer requests, but God said it's bigger than that. I want you to carry nations. I want you to know that when I see you, I see nations. And I will move on your request on behalf of the nations because I see you. That's good news. Okay, so you're in Leviticus chapter 16. Leviticus 16, the Lord says to Aaron, I want you to be careful when you come in and out of here because I don't want you to die like your sons did, right? T tell your neighbor, you just can't just roll up on God. <laughs> right? So, so God is very careful of how we come into his presence. And one of the chief things that God says in this whole chapter, Leviticus chapter 16, to Aaron, that is key to how we posture ourselves into God's presence. Aaron is the chief priest, right? So under him is all, the, all of his sons, all their, their brothers and sisters, all the other tribes. You got Gershonites, you got Merorites, you got all of them, and you got the Levites. All of those are part of the priesthood. But Aaron, out of all these hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of priests, is the only one able to go into the presence of God. So ultimately, he is responsible to atone for all the sins of the priests and all these thousands of tribes that are around them. Twelve tribes and there are thousands of individuals. There is a tendency in all of us to feel, I must be something else. Yeah. <laughs> he has to answer to nobody but God. And God checks him and says, so, so listen Aaron, because your job, your function today is that I want to hear you intercede for the sin of the nation. Wow. Now, how are you going to do that when you feel you're exempt from it? Oh. So here's the check. Don't come in here telling me about what the people did. I want to hear what you have done. So he, he qualifies this whole day by saying, sacrifice for you and your family first. Right? And you've heard me talk about this particular day. Nobody else is allowed in here. So isn't that, isn't that good news that there's some things you can tell God it's just you and God? Right? Because folk will bust you out. They'll FaceTime you. <laughs> Facebook you. They have all your stuff all over the internet with another caption other than what you said. Oh, I don't check that out. You ain't gonna find me up there, it ain't me. Trust me, it's not me. So what are you talking about? I'm talking about this particular day, he's having to enter, and the scripture said, in one hand is the blood, and in his other hand is the censer. I believe that he is here before this veil, and God done this other supernatural miracle. And the reason why I believe it, because in the spirit, it happens to us every day. That the moment we receive Jesus Christ, we are translated into another kingdom. We have stepped over into another place. I believe on this particular day, when Aaron comes into this holy place of God, he is translated from the holy place into the most holy place by the power of the Holy Spirit. Nobody's there to pull the curtain back. He's automatically there. He's got two qualifiers, blood and worship. Now, the blood is what he did. Worship is what you do. Ask your neighbor, what's your praise level like? Mm. There? Let's go to Hebrews chapter 9. Hebrews chapter 9. Come on, y'all got Bibles today, right? Come on, come on. I, I'm excited about having a bunch of people to preach to. And it's not 11 o'clock at night when I get up. I'm excited. <laughs> I'll tell y'all about that later. Uh, Hebrews chapter 9. Are you there? It look, look at verse 6. Now when these things were thus ordained, and I'm going to let you read all the front part because it talks about the tabernacle and the instruments that were in those compartments. Verse 6 said, Neil, now when these... Okay, so I, I want you to see what he's describing. He's calling the holy place. That was the room 
where the seven-tiered candlestick was here, the, ark, the table of showbread was over here, <clears throat> and the ark of the incense was here, and here was a veil. It's called in this scripture the first tabernacle. Now, in front of the first tabernacle was a courtyard. Right? Courtyard was, was, was open. Uh, in the courtyard, you had this, this altar burnt offering, okay? Mm -hmm. And then you had the labor where the priest washed their hands, all right? Then you went into the first tabernacle. Now, the scripture said, in this first tabernacle, the priest went all the time. Right. Now, keep reading. But the second, into the? High priest alone once every year. Say it again. The high priest, the priest alone, alone when? Once every year. All right. Into? Okay. So the priests were always in this place. The priesthood was already always in this place. They were tending to the oil at the candlestick, attending to the showbread, attending to the worship. Right? But once a year, the high priest, making sure he had blood, he was the only one once a year that could come back here. And the scripture said, the Holy Ghost, this signifying that what? So while this whole sanctuary, tabernacle, was standing, the Holy Ghost was signifying not only was the way not made manifest, manifest but only one individual, once a year, with blood, could go back there. Okay. Now, notice what the scripture said. It didn't say the way wasn't made. It, was not manifest. it wasn't manifest. It was not clear what God was really saying about this other place. Now, why would God say, I want to meet you back here and not let you get there? Why would God say, I really want you to be back here where I'm at, but I'm not going to allow you to get there today or this dispensation? Why would God tempt us like that? Why would God give us a vision and then say, though it tarry? <laughs> Why would God give you all these dreams and hopes and aspirations and then say, not yet? What would be his purpose? Is he mean like that? I mean, we do that to kids. I'm going to give you some candy. Be quiet. I'm going to give you some candy. Quick crying. Quick crying. I'm going to give you some. Give you some. Oh, child, fall asleep. You ain't got the candy yet. Is, is that how God does this? Huh? Is that how God does this? Is he hoping that we're going to forget? Is he hoping that, you know, I'm just going to throw it out there, get him excited, they get all pumped up for church service, go home, and, you know, I'll let the preacher say it again and again, and after a while they're just like, okay, we just forgot about that, what next? Is that how we do? No. Or was God trying again? To create an appreciation and desperation of people so that when the door got open, we would so want it that we would never leave it. That our appetite for him, our desire for him becomes so insatiable that once we got in, we would never desire anything else. I would love to tell you that the church goes back there all the time. But we still play out here in this front room. What do you mean by that? We like all the illumination of the, of the Holy Spirit. We like all the provision shown at the bread of his. We like this praise and worship thing good. But don't ask us to go over there. Because see, I can play with the gifts and spirit and still not like you a whole lot. I can invite you over to my house and we can break bread together and I'm so glad when you leave. <laughs> I can come to the altar. I can praise and worship God yeah. all day yeah. by myself. Yes. But to get on the other side means I have to look at you as God looks at you. And no matter what you've done to me and others, mercy pulls me in check. I don't want to go over there. 
ask me to give up some things if I go there. Right? Let's keep reading. But the Holy Ghost, this signified that the way into the holiest of all it was not, not, not yet made, not manifest while the first was standing. Nine says, which was a figure for the time then present, in which were offered both gifts and sacrifices that could not make him that did the service perfect as okay. pertaining to the conscience. Keep going. Do you have to go somewhere? I can get somebody else to read you, okay? All right, keep going. Which stood only in meats and drinks, mm -hmm. in diverse washings, and in ter uh, carnal ordinances imposed on them until the time of reformation. Okay. Levin says, but Christ being come a high priest of what? Good things to come. By a greater and more perfect testament. That's, what, that's to say not made with hands, right? Not of this building, neither by the blood of goats and cats, but by his own blood he entered in how many times? Once. Once into the holy place, having obtained eternal, eternal redemption. Okay. So what the high priest, Aaron, had to do every year, Jesus did, take it one time. One time. And he did that for eternal redemption. Take it in. I've got eternal. In Christ. Come on. I need you to say it. In Christ. I have eternal redemption. Which means I am covered now and forever. Everything. Anything I could possibly do is blood covered. Okay, now, that's the truth. Real Christians don't say, I got a license to cut you. I got a pass to do whatever I want to do because I'm covered. Well, the Bible says, well, if you're really connected to God, sin don't dwell in you like that. It doesn't mean that you don't have slip ups. It doesn't mean you don't have, it doesn't mean you have moments. But you don't go out practicing sin. Is that correct? Come on, you have to qualify that for some kind of folk, right? All right. So, but, but understand, because Jesus.